Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back with the CD32. So, a huge thanks to Stefan in Denmark. Uh, did I say Sweden in previous videos? Uh, he may be on the border between Denmark and Sweden, but anyway, I think he's Danish. Yeah, Amiga CD32, he sent me two of the FMV modules, so they're kind of in pieces at the moment. He already sent them that way, you know, he's obviously had a look at these, I think, or someone has. So, yeah, this, we've got two of these uh, things here, two PCBs, two of the shells. Not got any screws, I don't think, so, uh, yeah, that could be an interesting one. This one's obviously missing the uh, BIOS there. So, yeah, first inspections of these boards, one of them, I think this one, has had a, a lot of rework. All of the chips up here, like, they've been sort of swapped or something. There's a crack on one of the caps here, I'll show you that in a minute, I noticed that straight away. The cap on this one's okay, um, and this one, I don't know, I don't think this one's been tinkered with. Could be wrong, it might be this one, no hang on. Yeah, I was going to say, it, I think it's this one actually that's had the chip swapped, and this label here was like peeled up as if it had been affected by hot air, I see some flux around there. But first of all, I thought I'd like trying to test these to see what they're doing. Now the problem is because they're not in the shell, they're going to sag down and shorten the shielding. So you know what, I'm going to have to tear this down I think, right at the start here. I'm going to need to do that probably in order to be able to even access them and measure anything actually in the circuit. So we'll get the screws out of the underneath of this carefully, uh, disconnect the uh, ribbon for the uh, drive. May need to mm, short the lid detect thing because there's a thing isn't there there's something there that resets it when you've got the lid open if I remember this you know it's like one of the cables that comes off here so I mean you could just disconnect that and plug that in I might end up doing that I don't know but I might be able to just bypass it with a Japont or something so yeah this CD32 needs a recap so that's going to be in the follow-up video I think and I've also got a TF360 from the amazing Mr. Town player Stephen Leary um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to building that. So I'm just going to be uh, extra careful here just to avoid scratching the lid. I think there's five screws and there's one at the centre here and then uh, the corners. So what is, so adding this bit at the end, what is Video CD? It's a format and a media combined really, you know, it's a CD, compact disc, and you can put a video on it, yeah? Typically you've got two discs with these, because a CD, you know, what are they hold, about 680 meg or something, 700 meg roughly. You could get 800 megabyte discs, uh, I'm assuming there's two discs, yeah there is. Yeah, most of these were split for that reason into two discs because many films are more than the 74 or 80 minutes aren't they so I've got a few different ones here I've got the original Naked Gun the same one the third one and In Bed with Madonna um, yeah it was more popular in uh, Asian countries you know like uh, Japan it was super popular in Japan I think video CD there was quite a bit of support for this platform in the 1990s it came out in about 1993 it was uh, created by Philips Sony Panasonic and JVC I think um, and there was yeah quite a lot of support in the West in terms of different players. You had things like the Philips CDI, the later 3DO would do video CD, I think. You may have had to have a module or something on the back for some of these devices. Uh, in fact, you did. You did with the Philips CDI. It's so an FMV module just like this that you would plug into the back of the CDI. Certainly the earlier ones, the later ones may have had the... Uh, MPEG decoder because that's what it the, the compression format of the data on these the audio and video is MPEG and MPEG if you're not familiar is motion picture expert group so the video CD format used MPEG 1 now if you know anything about DVD that uses MPEG 2 um, and then obviously later you've got Blu-ray which uses uh, other, I can't remember what it is, I'll stick it top left there, other types of higher compression you know higher bit rate and stuff and you get better compression so yeah, Video CD was an improvement on VHS, as I've mentioned when I covered the CDI stuff. But the downside to it really was the having to swap the disc over halfway. And that's one of the reasons I think it failed. It just didn't really pick up here in the West like it did in Japan. Without no further ado, let's try and lift the lid. Now, if memory serves, the flat flex is right on this side here. And you can sort of lift and yeah, hold it like that. But then you've got to somehow try and lift the plastic hood up when it's tucked down there like that. This is where pliers would help. And I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to get pliers in that gap. There we go, it's come off now. I thought flex can come out. 
and we can disconnect that there. This is where we may need a um, to pump or something just to trick it into uh, booting up. The ribbon edge there all looks alright but those can fold up pretty easily. Yeah so at this stage you don't need to get the shielded off further. We do need to do something here to um, get it to boot I think because it's going to think, mind you it might power on alright, I think it may just think the drawers open. That might be what happens and obviously we're not bothered about the disc just at the moment. Yeah and just for now I've just connected the, the three composite connections on the back just in order that we can actually get some video output. So yeah, we don't need the drive at this stage or the uh, switches and things, you know, uh, that connect to that little JST connector. I uh, fold behind the uh, chair there. So yeah, first PCB is in there. We need to just simply try and align the uh, connector on the back there and push it into position. It feels really spongy that. Anyway, and then just to make sure there's no chance that this is short and you know what? I think I'm just gonna just wedge the plastic of the handle in there like that. And let's just uh sense check, yeah, put it on. Now we do have video. The question is, how would you know how would you know whether the the module's doing anything. So from the start here, I didn't do any research. I wasn't familiar with how this unit should work, the FMB module. You know, did you need a disc in there or not? And it turns out you do need a video CD in. So I fast forwarded through all this initial testing here. It was just coming up with, as you can see here, the uh, you know, sticky disc in screen. It wasn't really doing anything. Um, I then swapped over to the other board. The ROM wasn't fitted there. So, so I fitted the ROM and tested doing just the same thing. So I came to the conclusion it must need the disc in the drive. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to put the wrist strap back on while I just uh, finger touch some of these things. Let's just switch it on. Look at the screen. Yeah, it's booting. So this is the other board, obviously. Obviously it's missing the ROM, so that's not going to do much, is it? Anyway, it's just the same, so let me get the BIOS on. So Stefan kindly uh, provided this in here. So pins look nice and straight. This one's 40.28. I think the other one's 40.28 as well. Yeah. It's like the ones on the 500 plus where the socket's bigger. So yeah, it's aligned to this side here, the right side. So you've got a gap at pin one. Right, so a lot of cursing uh, later and swapping boards around with the uh, BIOS. One of them is doing something. This one doesn't do anything. The one that's had lots of uh, solder work on it. This one, as you can hear, is clicking and squeaking. I can only show you a second or two of that because it's uh, copyrighted. You can't really uh, hear the sound there, so <laughs> there's no chance of a content match on that. Um, so the question is, is it struggling to read the disc? Because you know what? It's having a new laser, this, isn't it? So it should be all right. But my point is, I don't know, it took a while to start. It had a few, you know, it started flashing a bit. And I'll show you actually, let's just power cycle it. Let's just to stop the disc. And you can sort of see how long it takes. And I'm just not sure if this is normal, so watch the laser. And in fact, the first power cycle, it took ages to actually come on, which is weird. Could be the reset circuit in there. So it went off, see? Then it goes on again. I'll tell you what's on the screen, nothing, man. It's still like off. On a minute on again see this is the thing hang on and then on off and then i think there you go starts to stream so is that normal i don't know um if i was to hazard a guess what's going on here it's sound related clearly the video is rock solid crystal clear stable etc which makes you think about audio decompression there could be separate ram for Mm, yeah, there could be. Se there probably is separate RAM for audio decompression and RAM for picture decompression. I mean, if we have a look at this card here, um, what have we got? We've got a RAM here. We've got a RAM here. So yeah, I'm thinking could be one of those. I would expect the smaller one, 
button to be for audio but you know what that looks really tiny i don't even think that that is for uh audio let's just look at it yeah it's an 814256 so that's pretty small but then again it doesn't need to be that big could also be a DAC problem maybe uh how long we got a green as well let me show you see the picture's green so yeah i saw this on rmc's channel i've seen it before on the uh, forums and stuff probably capacitors i think or oh, it could be the DAC, video DAC. but i'm thinking the squeaks could be an audio DAC problem so yeah multiple issues for sure and obviously this board doesn't work at all at the moment anyway it's quite entertaining watching it all in green with the squeaks and clicks but yeah copyright content match blocker here uh, just thinking out loud here the picture is solid which means the cd read speed is correct you know 150k per second that the drive uh, needs to do for video cd isn't an issue so yeah it's just the audio decompression and that color issue with this particular one so I think I may just start on the colour issue and I'll just blitz the, uh, well the measure first, but blitz the, the three caps and I think they're here, red, one for red, green, blue, I'm not sure which one's which. We've got a cracked cap on this board here, so you know, maybe the same sort of issues happened over there, but yeah, we'll just measure, I'll measure on resistance so that one of them's turned into a resistor. So I've looked at the schematics, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, this is the RAM for the sound side, this is the sound um, decompressor it's going to be handed uh, the data via serial probably from uh, the main MPEG uh, chip there this I think is for the video side of things uh, but anyway just inspecting around here uh, and I noticed this very early on but I didn't point it out yeah there is a green mark here someone marked that to say there's an issue or I don't know is that I might be seeing things I don't know but anyway yeah so I'm going to get the fiberglass pen onto that clean up the surface, uh, unblock it I think because I may have soldered in it and push a piece of kind art through to the other side and then solder it and then retest to see if the audio comes back. Yeah so on first inspection this FMV module can look complex but it isn't really, there's not a lot on there and it's quite simple the way it's laid out. So this is the main MPEG chip here, the CL450U200 and you can see we've got uh, some connections here to U210. This is the video DAC. We know this because you've got red, green and blue connections coming out here. You can see you've got analog blue, AB, analog green, analog red. In fact, those are inputs. Those are inputs from the CD32. So it looks like this chip here is merging the red, green and blue from the CD32. Yeah, and then we've got AR X, analog red external. So that goes out analog green x and analog blue x so yeah it's quite simple uh, in terms of coupling and this is where you're going to get color problems it's going to be you know one of these caps here uh, so that's uh, 0.22 yeah it's 220 nanofarad 0.22 microfarad uh, there's one there on the green and one on the red so those three caps and if you saw the rmc uh, video there where Neil and Mark looked at CD32 um, and it's been pretty well documented this I've seen other people talking about this in the years gone by the caps on here the ceramic caps not necessarily electrolytic ones but the ceramic ones the electrolytics leak and I think Stefan has already recapped this uh, I'll talk about that later in the video because I think they're a bit high the caps um, height you know physical height they need reducing a bit because I know the lid won't fit um, the other thing that could be going on here is the resistors, you know, if you had a problem with one of these resistors somewhere, that could cause an issue as well. And of course, the actual video DAC itself could be the issue, but the fact we have uh, colour and then we get like a green tinge, I suspect it's going to be one of these ceramics here. Right, I'll show you in a minute up close, but I found a broken trace on the uh, negative side of that cap. Yeah, the three common uh, ones for the colours here, these these ones. I've tested these with the ESR meter and they're all good and I think they've been swapped and they kind of look like they've been swapped to me. Um, we can recap this if we need to but anyway I'm going to swap as a precaution to the colour thing swap all three of these ceramics and again I've measured these in circuit using the peak LCR tester and they're okay so I'm just going to get a little bit of solder and use the iron uh, just rather not uh, just use the iron to drag these sideways uh, and then I've got some brand new ones here. They're the exact right length, they're just uh, a bit narrower. 
but the super high quality ones so they should be all right so i'll report it back in a sec so yeah a little bit of solder on each side and just heat the sort of two sides together there we go a bigger chisel tip hang on it came out and then it, it sucked itself back yeah a bigger chisel tip would be better I just uh, tapped that onto the uh, bench there I'll just do all three at the same time right? just change the angle slightly there we'll just get a wee bit of flux onto each of those just helps the dissolved braid Okay, that's one. Gonna be further down the braid, I think. There we go. Uh, oh, I'm gonna just lob those three on there. Yeah, I've just rotated the board a bit there. Hopefully, that's not gonna uh, blur. Yeah, as I say, if these aren't quite straight, I am not too worried. The key at the stage, just to get them on. And yeah, I do have some tweezers, so I could be, or should be using tweezers. Yeah, so we'll straighten up in a minute. Just making sure those are on, and they are. And the main thing is I just want to just test it and see if that solves the problem with the collar. I don't think the fix to the cap it here is going to make any difference to the audio. I think with the audio, we've got a problem with this chip here, problem with connectivity, or it's RAM. Right, so this is what I get for working late at night when I'm so tired. I've swapped the wrong, <laughs> the cap's on the wrong board. This is the board I was looking at. This is the one where I fixed the cap there. It's not made any difference to the, uh, any difference to the sound. Um, this cap here, if I just uh, put the points on here, I'll show you the mirror in a sec. A minute ago, it was showing seven ohms on that cap, which is uh, a bit weird. Could have just been some flux. It's showing around, right you can hear it going ding ding. I'll show you in a sec. Yeah, I'm just going to just test these three caps again with the uh, other tester because this one here for ESR can't really test uh, ceramics with that. It's designed for electrolytics and tantalums and things like that, you know, sort of things over, I don't know, point, uh, four, seven of a microfarad, that sort of thing, probably. Might go lower. Yeah, so using the LCR meter here, uh, this came from the uh, Ellison Charlotte, actually. Yeah, I'm sorry you can't see what I'm doing here. Hang on. Yeah, you can see an approximate reading there, 274 nanofarad. Um, so, I don't know, it's, it's mysterious. The thing I would say as well, you've got to have the positive on this meter on that side, otherwise it measures as a resistor. So, I mean, in terms of the meter, it's sort of showing all right, but we know these are all right, so, you know, I'm going to swap these anyway, just like I did on the other blooming board, and, uh, yeah, we'll give it a try. Right, that has solved the uh, colour problem, I think, because the key was, when it was fading in between scenes and things, when it goes black, it was like green. Now it's not. So, yeah, one problem down, just the audio issue to do with on this uh, card. Yeah, so thinking about this audio issue here, you've got the L6411 here, um, LSI Logic. Uh, so that's the, I don't know if it's a 100 pin, isn't it, quad flat pack, which I suspect is doing the decompression of the uh, audio your mp1 mp2 audio so i need to have a look at the data sheet for that i'll do that later i think um so it's got three connections here that go to the dac this is the audio dac yeah so the audio dac could be the issue out of the audio dac you've got left and right audio here and then some op amps yeah it, and obviously your audio outputs that go to the CD32 and get mixed with the normal audio. So it's very unlikely to get pops and squeaks from this section here. Now I know this because my prior experience dealing with MPEG, and you'll know this, if you've ever had video CD 
uh, from back in the day. You'll note that if you get like, a, I don't know, a knock the unit or if you've got little marks or scratches or, or dirt on the disc, a fingerprint, you get, uh, in terms of sound, you get pops, squeaks, clicks, video, you might get blocks, random called blocks appearing in different places, the odd artifacts, etc. Uh, so those sort of problems you can get with problems reading the actual disc, you know, before it gets into this decoder here. But it could also be this decoder. The other interesting thing is look at this corner here. So there's the same chip again, L64111. And you sometimes find this, if you're looking at schematics, uh, you know, you've only got a few connections here. You may think, is that all that chip does? Just says these connections and that? That's not a lot. Check the other pages of the schematics because the, the logical functionalities are separated into different areas. And that's what we've got here, the, the RAM side of this L64111. It's got a RAM there, and we looked at that a minute ago. That's going to be the first thing I'm going to consider swapping. I think it's more likely to be this, but it's 100 pins. I really don't want to swap that chip between this board and the other board. We don't know the state of the one on the other board, so that would be a recipe for disaster. I mean, you could just argue the same with the RAM, but I think I've got a spare RAM. If not, we'll just borrow the RAM from the, the board that's not booting at all. Um, yeah, so it's 256K by 4. So, yeah, from memory, it's the same chip time although it's in a SOJ package that you get on an A500 Plus. Um, I fitted four of those onto an A500 RAM board, there'll be uh, a link up there for that. So I think I've got none of those spare now, but I'll check, I'll just check I've got some, if I've got any first, and if not we can pull one off the other board or off the GVP. Yeah, so it's four data bits, I think those are at the bottom there. Address bus, eight or nine address bus bits there, RASCAS, write, enable, and output enable, or something like that. So dead simple. Uh, and we can perhaps scope that maybe as well. But in general, the pops and clicks and stuff and squeaks, I don't think it's going to be the DAC, but you know what? It could be. This is a digital interface as well. And I might just swap the DAC um, if the RAM doesn't solve it. Just because it's easier to swap that than that um, quad flat pack 100 pin uh, <laughs> decoder IC. And the other thing I may do before I swap the decoder IC is this 22 Pika forward cap here. I mean, I could scope this, it's not the easiest thing with because I've got to have the lid sort of down in order to read a disc properly. But yeah, I might scope this clock here. We've got a 16 point something megahertz clock here that feeds the DAC. If there was some jitter or something on here, maybe we could get that sort of thing, but I don't think so. I think the, 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 the way the sound is glitching is kind of pointing to the decompression side of things. So an interesting thing just happened, I was playing the video and then I smelt something burning and it reset. It's that cap. It's the same as exact same cap that's happened to the other one. I actually think the caps on these turn into resistors and then uh, that's the problem. So we might need to swap the ones that look the same physical size on this. Um, because these three fix the colour. So yeah, I need to now remove that because that's kind of like uh, shorted I think. Right, so I removed that cap. And thankfully, it didn't kill the CD32 or the FMV unit. Yeah, it's really weird. It was uh, quite charred, the board as well. It's going to need a bit of clean-up work right now. And, uh, yeah, just having a uh, think about this popping and squeaking. It's quite relaxing, actually. It sounds like water. I actually think this, what we're hearing here, is an audio decompression artefact. Yeah, so this LSI chip here does the audio decompression, but it uses this RAM, and then it outputs the DAC. Now, the other possibility I did consider here, the ceramics, you know, the ceramic on the board that's in there at the moment here is uh, balked, you know, blasted apart. Oh, sorry, this one here, not that one. Blasted apart, so I've replaced it now. Um, and these three, those need straightened up on this board here. Um, were an issue, well, one of them was with the colour. So, the other possibility is maybe another ceramic. If this, I mean, it might not even be the same size, you know, this one's 220 nanofarad, uh, you know, 0.22 microfarad. But there are some 22 picofarad ones on this board, and there's obviously an awful lot of caps on the underside. Um, I, I'm thinking one for a crystal for this, maybe, because if you had a tiny bit of jitter on here, or something like that, if it wasn't just quite right the clock to this in theory the decompression could be uh, glitching a bit so you know what, it could be a clock thing actually the big problem is, how would you scope it? this is the thing, I'd have to take the neck out of here support it away from the shielding 
do something with the, you know, the, uh, I don't know, the lid sense thing, the JST connector under there, it's just really fiddly to work on. I don't like working on things like this because of that, you know, the awkwardness of it. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is just go and compare this board to the schematics and any of the ones that look the same sort of physical size as that one. There's like one here, there's one there, there's one there, one here. I mean, they're probably just on the main supply rails here. Swap them out. So I'll show you some of the scope and I'll try and uh, highlight on a diagram some of which pin. So uh, this is pin one. You see that? We've got a problem. We've got a logic level problem. I think this is the address lines going to the RAM. When I said RAM, we're talking about the audio RAM here. If we do a run stop, you can see these weird peaks. This is the problem. I think the addressing is balked. Um, now, because it's not pulled, it's not going high, maybe we need to just pull it high or pull it low. I don't know. I'm going to try. Anyway, so that's pin one, pin two, same problem. Pin three, looking normal. Pin four, looking normal. Pin five, pin is not used, I think. And then on the other side, so this is the first from the, you know, this is the end pin. Nothing there, the one next to it. Balked again, logic levels. One next to that, box again. Uh, the next one, okay. So we've got like four, what's well, like four address bits, I think, there, because I think that's what goes on that side, unless that's the data bus. In either case, it could be the data bus actually. These could be address bits over here, I'm going to, you know, on the same side, furthest away from pin one, almost at the uh, other side of the uh, chip here. These are all looking fine. So you know what? One of the buses there, either the address bus or the data bus, and I'm thinking it could be the data bus because we've got four pins. It just looked really messy, didn't they? If we can clean that up with some ports pull downs, maybe the glitches will go away. Might actually be able to fix this. Yeah, so just uh, pausing it there. The audio goes away, but you see there is a mute capability on that chip. It can send a, a, a mute, I think, a mute signal. So it may well be that it's muting the audio, which means the DAC is not getting anything. But if it doesn't do that and it just keeps feeding, you know, like is it a quiet level to the DAC, that would show that the DAC is all right. But I suspect it's probably muting the DAC. Could go suspiciously quiet when you pause it. Um, yeah, so I'm going to continue looking at the ceramics just to rule those out, but then I think I'll swap that RAM, that DRAM, because I've got some of those as spares. Yeah, so I don't think it's going to be another ceramic unless it's one of the 22 peak fires, but they're a different size, and there's probably going to be a reason why this, these ones here failed. The 12 volt supply uh, feeds into those, you know, you get cap problems somewhere, in theory. Yeah, it could cause some sort of failure. Um, ceramics, are, those ones seem to be more prone to, um, you know, shorting. So I'm just, just going to just try and heat this up. Just there. Lob that off. I've got a wee bit of flux on there, use the dissolder braid and get a new chip on. Right, so swapped that RAM out. I didn't have a brand new one, I had to take one from uh, the GVP, which you saw hopefully in a previous video. So it's not the RAM. Ah, oh, that's not good news. So, oh, what a pain. It's going to be that LSI chip, isn't it? I guess the next obvious thing is the DAC. Because we obviously had a supply problem, I think, on the 12 volt side, which may cause problems with the 7805 on the DAC side. Maybe it had some laptop type issue or something. Right, so swaps the audio DAC. I know I haven't shown you that, but there's going to be an opportunity on the next board to do a bit of uh, SMD work. If this doesn't work, it's going to be the LSI, probably, unless it is just a clock thing. I really should go and maybe check some of those caps on the crystals and things. There we go, so it's not the DAC. <laughs> oh, that is so annoying. 
it's really annoying when it's a custom like that. I mean, in theory, it could be the main MPEG decoder chip there because that's what you know takes the the data packet if you think about it, you know like the block of data from the optical drive and then it's splitting it up in its cons into its uh, constituent parts of video and audio and it hands over the audio to the LSI to do the audio decompression it's like MP1 is it or MP2 I think yeah predecessor to MP3 but yeah, trying to get those customs is pretty much near impossible these days. Right, I guess what I should do really is, is swap that. But yeah, I'm stepping in the dark here, educate guess. Can you see here the pins on this look dark? Three pins there. Um, yeah, this passes some signals for uh, this chip, presumably to the lattice. So you never know it, it could be that but these look like they've all been swapped but we don't know where from maybe they just got reflowed so yeah i'm going to swap that i've got some hct 245s um yeah getting desperate i had a look ut source you can request a price for these but they're probably going to want to sell you like 100 or something so that's unobtainium uh that is unobtainium um you can only really get them from another board. We might have to use the other board to get this one working. And then, yeah, it's going to be one out of the two. Now, Stefan did say I could keep one of these if I can get them both working. But, yeah, I think it's just going to be uh, one working. And I'll just return them both to Stefan, I think. It's not easy to test this. Obviously, lots of these caps need reflowing and stuff now because I've re <laughs> replaced them for 220 nanofarad. There's still a few on there, actually. There's one, uh, what is that? There's one here, 220. And there's one somewhere else, I can't see it now. Anyway, yeah, I'll swap those later. It's like, if that was adding a bit of resistance to the 5 volt rail, it's not going to be pulling it down enough. And you know what? When you get that kind of resistive thing on these, that's when they burn up like that one did. You know, they turn into resistors, they uh, very soon thereafter set on fire. Yeah, so I'm going to get that off with some hot air and get a new one on. We'll get some caps and tape uh, just over that label. Uh, I could add some flux here to speed up the process, but just from experience of some of the other IC removals on here that we've done so far, they come off really, really easy, and there's a bit of flux already under there, I can see it now moving around from where it was presumably reflowed or swapped previously. Go. So I'm just going to have a go at uh, soldering that on. I've sort of anchored it in position and I did uh, reflow with hot air just to get it to sort of pull itself into a better position. But anyway, we've got some solder on the tip here and I'm just going to just bob into making sure that's up to temperature actually. Yeah, just have a bit of a drag. On here. You know, I'm not sure if that's floating off the board a little bit. Stuff like this I generally have to do off camera so I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. Anyway, yeah, you saw that side. So I need to check the bridges there. But, uh, yeah, anyway, you get the idea. Right, after the insane amount of uh, work I've done to this, I found something that might actually prove mm, not related, but faulty anyway. This little inductor here says R423. Um, sometimes these are used to filter, you know, between, I don't know, one power rail and an, uh, another side of the board kind of thing. Sometimes they're also useful, though. They, sometimes engineers design them in to allow you to be able to isolate power to a certain section. Not always, but, uh, yeah, in this case, I'm not sure what that feeds until I look at the schematics, but test on continuity, it's just an inductor. It should be like zero ohms or something thereabouts, so maybe an, an ohm or two. Nothing. 
it's open circuit. Now this is the cab that fried, did it take that out? I don't know. So it might have no relation to the audio issue. I mean, I've, I've done everything on this board. There's, there's nothing else to do now, apart from consider that audio uh, decompressing IC there, or the main MPEG uh, decoder there. I think that separates the video, like I say, the video processes the video but separates the audio feeds into this, and then the lattice which supports everything. That's, I think, um, uh, I was going to say an FPGA. I don't think it is, I think it's a CPLD. You've got to program it up. It could be an FPGA. I don't see what else it could be. There's no bad traces or anything on here. There's another one of those little uh, things here, little ferrite. That's a short. There's one here on this corner. That's a short. So, yeah, this is open circuit. So just to test, I'm just going to bridge that with a piece of wire. I've got some inductors, we can swap it out later. Let's just see if that makes any difference, but I mean the location down here, hmm, maybe something's not getting a supply. That, that's a possibility. It could be that the DAC hasn't got proper supply. That would make the issue uh, we are seeing here, you would create the issue we're seeing here. So you never know, then maybe there's hope for this. I'll report back in a few minutes. Yeah, so I've just swapped my attention to the other board. Um, tidied up the uh, three caps there, so those are straight now. Removed the balked cap there, gonna swap that in a sec. Just checking these ferrites, this one's open circuit, I can sort of show you that. See? Interesting, isn't it? Uh, these actually connect to the shield. I think that's all it does is it joins up the ground to the shield. So it's really weird how those break. It could be impacts from you know prizing the shield and off maybe right so on this other one i haven't checked the voltages yet but i'm guessing we're missing one perhaps um i just measured around some of these caps here got short short so it, it could be another one of these uh, big uh 220 nanofarads that's short in somewhere but uh, yeah these caps here uh, are short and i compared to the other board that isn't the case you know they shouldn't be so yeah, this <laughs> this is uh, definitely a capacitor short in somewhere, or one of the main ICs. It could be one of the main ICs. It just uh, throws up the uh, sticker disk in screen, the normal um, you know stick your CD in. Those have all been swapped. It looks like I suspect Stefan may have swapped the ships between this board and the other board, or may have swapped you know blitzed them on both of them. I don't know. If I measure there, yeah, we've got. A very low resistance. I'll tell you the resistance. Yeah, 55 ohms. What we're doing on this one, isn't that one we swapped it, the ceramic there. So it's got to be one of these other ones. So I'm just going to measure around, see if we can get, uh, see what, you know, the lowest resistance my meter will show me and see if we can work out which one is the offending cap. On the other one, I've swapped all of those large 220 nanofarads. If you've got a CD32 FMV module, buy some decent quality 220 nanofarad caps and swap all of those large ones on there because they're just going to fail <laughs> it's, it's inevitable this is exactly the problem i think between these two boards on the other one we've got a secondary fault i'm hoping if i can get this one to boot it, this one may spring to life the only thing that's missing at the moment of this is the audio dac if we get that back on and find the audio is fine then i'll take a risk and i'll swap this over to the other one if that works and solves the problems we've got both of them up and running and i'll need to find a supplier of these somewhere right so i removed a couple of caps on the underside here we've still got the low resistance of like 50 roughly 55 ohms i think so i'm just going to remove that chip i've got some flux around it um, and what I may do is try it on the other board actually, but we'll see first of all if the resistance disappears, if the resistance disappears there's no point in trying it. Yeah, I'm going to come in from this angle down here I think. There we go. Not putting any pressure there, it just made that noise. There we go, as it reached temperature. It's just, yeah, lob that in there. So I'll let that kill down, we'll see if the short has uh, gone. Right, I removed the chip from the other board as well. I'm just gonna test it without a chip, just to see what it does. Like, will it actually boot without the audio decompressor chip there? 
Um, and then we'll try and put the, the warm one. It doesn't get hot, don't get me wrong, it doesn't get boiling. We'll stick that on here, because we've still got the 55 ohm short on the other board. So it isn't that, and warm might just be one of these things. Sometimes you can get a chip that runs warm, sometimes they run cold. It's like, it's just one of those things, but it doesn't get hot. So let's just uh, try this now and see what it does without that chip. I'm hoping it'll boot and we'll just like be lacking audio. It's pretty sulky when it's on its side, the CD32, I have to admit, and it's because of the focus with the laser. You know, it kind of has a bit of a hard time trying to focus on the disc. If you get the lid sort of just right, it can start to read pretty well, but like right at the moment it's, it's struggling to read. I might have just put the lid down, I think. Yeah, it seems without that chip, it, it scans the disc a number of times when you first power it on. You know, like reads the disc, identifies what it is, and then it just freezes. And I'm guessing it's probably trying to initialise uh, the MPEG stuff and the MPEG chain there is trying to do something with the audio. And maybe because it's not receiving an interrupt or some sort of response, it just gets stuck in a loop. Yeah, I mean, I did just reseat it. I'll try and reseat it again just to make sure it is firmly connected, but that seems to be the response there. So the next thing here is to just uh, hold the chip. So just the smallest little touch there and I moved it. Right, I've anchored that in a couple of positions. So I'm now going to get the cam to get some flux around it and do a bit of drag soldering. So I'll just get some flux around this. It's anchored a bit weird because it's anchored here and it's anchored up there. It's going to sound crazy, but I've got so much less space here than I did when I was on the floor. I'm not sure if that's in focus or not. I'll try and show you a single pass here. So I'll start in the middle somewhere. And I just have a bit of a drag from the midpoint. Yeah, we've got a bridge in the middle there. We've got a bridge also on the end. Anyway, you get the idea. You've seen it all before. I've cut it on so many videos. Yeah, as you can see here, this is a better example of soldering the same kind of IC. I'm sorry the focus was out there. I was rushing for a number of reasons through this repair. So, yeah, the some of the camera work was not as good as it could have been. Right, just cleaning up now with some IPA. Yeah, it probably comes across in this video. I have been in a rush with this one. Just because we've got some of the stuff arriving this has been sat around for blooming ages and I want to get it back to Stefan so I'm just going to clean with the toothbrush and then inspect for bridges So I'll just mop up now with a few cotton buds and then I'll probably just blow the board down with a bit of hot air just for a few seconds just to make sure there's nothing around there that could cause any issues. Right, well we've got no shorts, I've connected it up, let's just uh, set that down so it reads a bit better, switch it on, it's booting, hey, that fixed it, so there we go, 
I, I thought it was that chip, but you know what? I tried everything I could to avoid replacing the darn thing. Sweet. So, yeah, that's one. Hang on. One fixed. Yeah, those little chirps like that. That is normal. I think it's because I knocked it. You hear that? Sometimes you get them just from a tap. Just tap the unit. Tap it again. Yeah, yeah. So that's the sort of problem you get. So coming back to the one that isn't doing anything, I did drop Stefan a message to say, look, one of them I've uh, sorted out now. We've got the sound on it. It's working. Fantastic. The other one, I don't think I'm going to be able to repair. Um, because obviously we're a sound chip down, you know, the MP2, MP1 decoded down, that's one thing. But also it's just black screening, it doesn't do anything. You can't get it to boot at all. Um, and he was like, really kindly said, just keep them both, keep them both, Chris. It's sad that we can't get one each, but just keep them both. So I said, look, well, I haven't given up yet, and I asked the question at that point. I know it's on both boards, these five uh, chips here, the 74 series, I'll show you where they are in a minute. They've been reflowed. So, did you reflow them? Did you replace them? Did you swap them out? What happened with them? And he says, Oh no, I haven't touched them. I haven't done anything. I just recapped them. That's it. Now, that gave me the positive thought that, hang on a minute, if he hasn't swapped those chips, then there's a chance it's going to be the data bus side. Uh, so, that's where I'm going to start here. So, up here, you can see we've got UAB2, UAB1, UAB0. The U obviously is IC. You got a U before all of the ICs on this uh, on these things here. You know it might be U1, U2, U0. In this case, UA, UB, whatever. Um, and then the numbers. So we've got three for the address bus, and you kind of expect that because is it going to be 24 bits or something like that? Because these are eight bits each. You got eight, sixteen. Yeah, it's going to be like a 24 bit almost uh, address bus there. And then if you look at the top here, hopefully it's going to focus. You got uh, RS is that, and then read slash W R slash W read right. Um, so yeah, your read-write signals and your data strobe are going through there in order that the 68K can actually address uh, hardware on this card. Yeah, and then the data bus side, 16-bit data bus here, uh, 74HCT245s, and those are 245s as well. Um, that's all positive sounding to me because I'm thinking could be a balked data bus. You know, you get one bit that's failed on one of these 245s here. And suddenly you've not got bi-directional communication on one data bit to the, the, this board. I'm not sure what it communicates with directly. Probably this here, the UMPEG, is it? Which is a lattice CPLD. So this CPLD, just looking at this, it's doing some stuff to do with interrupts, uh, ROM enable, so ROM address decoding there, uh, config out, config in, I think. Uh, DS ACK, so you've got you know bus protocol stuff here in terms of communicating with the this as a memory uh, mapped device. Um, we've got CL450 control signals and things here. We've got the C6411 data strobe DS. So this is a middleman. It's a bit of glue logic. The CPLD is the interface into the MPEG chip. Yeah, and it's doing some address decoding for different things for the ROM, it's doing interrupt handling and stuff for the different devices. We've got interrupt stuff here, look, for the audio chip. So, yeah, it's glue, it's purely glue logic. We've got, uh, I don't know what these are here, some, I don't know, a bus of something going on there as well. Um, we've got the pixel switch stuff there for the video, is that so that it can, I don't know, maybe do some gen locking or something similar to that, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure what these key things are here, key connections. Yeah, config in. So it's an auto config device, that's interesting. Um, now, I, I, I had vague recollections of seeing an article where someone created an adapter for a Zorro slot where you could plug one of these in, but I can't find it anywhere. I'm not sure if I imagined that or not, but I actually think that this could be made to be a proper auto config device and plugged into a 2000 or a 4000 or a 3000 or something it might only work in late machines it might need Zorro 3 because you know the CD32 is you know it was the 32 bit you know it's the step up it was the same level as the 1200 and the 4000 so there could be some extra control signals and the clocks may be different and there could be some differences there I mean you, you can't stick that in a two you know a Zorro 2 slot but nevertheless it uses auto config it's using the config in config out and stuff and the 
you know, I, I reckon you could make that work in a 4000. There's some, a connector here that says do not use programming connector. So there we go, that's how you program this CPLD here, the lattice. But the code I don't think is available for that, so yeah, unless someone like Stephen Leary was prepared to spend a week or a month or something or however long it takes to reverse engineer that. And some of it you could probably just do by looking at the connections and things and doing a few logic captures for someone intelligent like Stephen, or super intelligent I really should say. Something like that might not be a problem. You know what, I think Stephen had actually planned to recreate the uh, FMV module in uh, an FPGA or CPLD. So you never know, watch this space at some point in the future that might happen. The functionality may get put into something else. I mean you could do the same thing in a Raspberry Pi actually. Raspberry Pi is fast enough to do MPEG decoding. You could literally, you know, have an interface, capture the data that's been, you know, this is the thing, this is doing the magic of actually separating the packets and things, presumably, into audio and video, um, unless the actual MPEG chip is doing that. Um, but if you can replicate that, you know, middleware functionality, and then and just decode using software on something like a Raspberry Pi, you could, in theory, have a Raspberry Pi do all of this. We've got two more 7.4 series up here. Now this is the one I swapped on the, the one with the sound issues earlier because we've got some connections here to the 6.4 uh, triple one. There's three or four of those there. You know, signals that get buffered and uh, how much you're where they go. I mean, it's saying here data bus. So, yeah, I'm not really sure which data bus is that the Amiga side. It probably is. So the Amiga can determine the state of some of the interrupt levels or whatever on there. Uh, you know, control signals that come out of the audio decompressor. But I swapped that as part of trying to rule out the audio issues before we finally swapped out the only other thing it could have been, which is what I first thought it was, which was the uh, L64111. Uh, and then also uh, another register or something here, a 273, is that? Yeah, a 273. Um, so, yeah, could that cause this to not boot at all? Maybe. But I am going to start with the data bus here. We'll do DB. Uh, zero and then move on to db1 see if that brings any life back so yeah just targeting data bus uh, buffer zero can you see there's a bit of corrosion or something here yeah some discoloration and it smelt a little bit and you can see it underneath the ic there so you never know i might actually ultrasonic this next you never know that might be the issue so i'm just going to clean under that i'll just use hot air to apply the chip we removed previously you didn't see on the other one when I was trying to get through to this, uh, get to the bottom of the sound issues, I swapped this here, the STAT1, just because it passes a couple of connections related to the MP2 uh, audio decompressor chip. And you can see I got that back on this board, this is one with a glitch, and I got the DAC back on as well, as well as any caps that I'd removed from this. I'm ignoring the 50 ohm thing just for the moment, um, and we'll just I don't know, see where we get to by targeting some of these things here. Again, a little bit of guesswork just because it's hard to work on these it's hard to really scope anything i mean i could do now i've managed to get the drive sort of working on its side might do that next actually uh, check the output on a one here maybe and see if it's actually accessing the one but this is the one um after this went through the ultrasonic and you know we cleaned up all the caps replaced the caps that would fail on here the ceramics and things around the power sections and stuff still sort of you know looks at the disc a couple of times and then just throws up the normal screen, the normal sticker disc in screen, so it's like it doesn't boot the MPEG side uh, for whatever reason, so yeah, it's got to be something here, this or this, everything else on here is kind of irrelevant, and yeah, I know that the voltages are okay, I can show you that in a minute, like a summary of what voltages to expect where on the board. There's a mark there, I think there's a bit of dirt or something around that. It's interesting how there's like some leakage or corrosion got under and around these. So it's anchored in the uh, bottom right down here. I'm just going to get some solder on the tip. This isn't the tip I usually use with uh, doing this sort of solder soldering. Yeah, I'm just going to bob into them because the surface area of the tip is so small. Yeah, drag soldering with it doesn't work so well. Anyway, you get 
Yeah, I did. That is one side done. And I don't see any bridges. Oh my god, there we go. Follow your hunches. Fix this one. You know, we swapped two buffer chips. This is the other board, the two data bus ones. And it's working. But we obviously got the squeaky, clicky audio because I fitted that uh, dodgy audio chip on that one. But the good news is both cards work. Yay! So I just need to try and source one of those chips. Let me see what I can find online. Right, so whilst that other one is on test, let's just deal with a few things. The first board, the RAM I put on here is 60 nanoseconds. And you know what? It didn't go on quite as straight as I would have liked. And we know that that wasn't the issue. I'm going to put the original RAM back on here. Uh, that came from my GVP, actually, uh, which was unrepairable, as you'll see in the video. Um, I need to replace that bit of wire with a the ferrite there. I need to replace the ferrite on the other one as well, because that's got a bit of wire there. Yeah, so here's the shell. If we set this into the shell, and I'm not sure which way round it goes, if we put it that way up, you'll see the 100 microfarad caps touch the edge of the board is not flat on these mounts here so yeah those 100 microfarad caps are too big now i was just looking through my spare electrolytics and i've got i don't know about 20 of these 100 microfarad 16 volts and if you look at the height of these they are about uh, two-thirds the height of those ones so they're going to be fine these are about the same height as the 47s at the back which are no higher they're less than the rom so i'm just going to get the other iron uh, powered up use both irons and just remove this strip of 100 microfarad caps here and what i'm going to do is uh, stefan originally said when i got them working he was like i'll just keep keep them both then but now i've got both working i'm going to keep the one with the uh, pops squeaks and crackles here you know what it's kind of therapeutic listening to the pops and squeaks and stuff it, it kind of sounds like water. <laughs> it's bizarre. I actually quite like it. I can actually sit here for a while watching this and listening to it and enjoying the pops and squeaks. Anyway, I'll try and source one of these. I did uh, put a request in with UT Source to try and purchase two. I might buy a few more if they say, you know, if they come back and say you could order five or something. And I don't know, if they're a reasonable price, like $10 each, I might just order five of them and keep one spare and sell the others or something like that yeah anyway i'm gonna do the left side with the antex and the right side with the Heiko. there we go it's warm it's quite difficult to do this not because uh, using two hands is difficult it's there we go there you go it's getting both sides up to temperature. That's all six of those removed. Uh, I'll just use braid now to suck up the solder. Yeah, those caps are good as new, and I think the Panasonic's or something. So I've just put them into my spare, so it's not really cost me anything in the way of capacitors here. As I say, we'll get this one working perfectly and ready to go back to Stefan. Because then I can send it back to him with his SID card, which has been sat around since just after the SID card video. Right, I'll show you the uh, first one here. One side, just rotate that around a little bit. Yeah, just have to mute that. It's got Beach Boys music on it at the moment. Hang on. I'm definitely going to get a copyright strike on that, even with all the water noise and fan noise. Yeah, I'm sorry this video has been really noisy. Anyway, you get the idea. So, yeah, just a little reflow, and uh, that's looking good as new. So, I'll just do the same thing for the five. Right, that concludes the swap of the tall caps for short caps. So it should fit into the shell. Um, as I said, there's a few final things to do to this, the first board here. I need to reflow that because that was just soldered on with hot air. And I'm just going to swap out one of the buffers here for one of the chips, the first one we removed on the other card. And uh, the reason is just to check whether that chip was faulty because I think it was just the second chip. 
and you may think well just put it in the bin but you know what they're starting to get to the point where they're a couple of pounds each those HCT SOP chips and they're starting to get low in volume so I don't like throwing away good 7-4 SOP ICs that uh, are proving harder to get Alright so some captain tape around the things I want to protect there uh, yeah, and we'll just uh, heat this, and this is coming off again. And then I'll solder this original one back on, and uh, drag solder the J uh, legs, wherever they are there. It's an SOJ chip, isn't it? And you might be wondering why, why, why am I taking this back off? Well, A, it's not flat. Uh, B, it's a 60 nanoseconds part. It should have a 100 on there. There we go. Uh, and the 60s are harder to find than the 100s. I mean, I say they're hard to replace, but you know, they're not really. You could buy a SIM. SIMs contain these. But a SIMs are now starting to get harder to find, aren't they? really tight around here because of the electrolytic. Good argue, we should have done that before uh, fitting the replacement electrolytic actually. Anyway, I'll just inspect, reflow anything that needs it and then that's that done. And then we'll test it having replaced that and it do need to reflow that as well in the exact same way with some flux around it. And then finally I'll swap out one of these data buffers with the other one. Once that all works then I'll just clean this up. I swapped out all of the 220 nanofarad caps on this because they seem to short on these. So there's just one more to do on this. Uh, there's one up there as well, actually there's two I think. I swapped that ferrite there with uh, just a one ohm resistor. I don't have any ferrites, uh, but it'll be fine. Uh, yeah, so only one of the data buffers was balked. I put the uh, original one, uh, one of the original ones back on the first one I removed actually. And that's working fine, so pleased about that. It means I've only had to use one HCT245. So this is Stefan's board, put it inside this shell. But you know what, the other shell is way better. It looks brand new. You can see that here, it's a nice uh, silvery colour. This bit here is a, a bit warped plastic, so yeah, I'm going to heat with some hot air, just see if we can massage that down, not too high temperature, you'll melt it. But if we can just get that straight there, then I think I'm going to reseat uh, or rehome Stefan's board inside this and then send it back to him, and then it's, it's like good as new, isn't it? And then I'll just use this one here with the bits of corrosion for mine with the <laughs> bodgy chip. Uh, yeah, so the boards are technically the wrong way around at the moment because this says ESCO and the board that's in that one is ESCO. So when it goes in here, it's going to be the other way, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be, have a different shell. But they're exactly the same board, they're just not the same shell. You know, one's like um, chromated and one's got like a nice silvery chromey sort of foot finish to it. And of course if this process goes wrong here, yeah, I'll be keeping this one and the other one will go to Stefan. So I'm just waiting for the hot air to come down. Uh, it, they always overshoot, so it's down to 130 degrees C. Yeah, or oh, degrees communist, as Chris Edwards says. It always makes me laugh when he says that. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah, it's pretty blooming bent, that plastic. Not sure how that's happened. Just on the end there, it's lifted up. Anyway, let's just uh, heat gently here and see if we can massage it. Yeah, it's going down already though. Yeah, so 130 degrees communist is just above boiling point. You could do with some glue under it, I think. I think what I would do here, this is plastic, just get a small piece of tape over there and stick a piece of tape over there and then it'll just sort of hold it and feed it when it goes in and out the unit without it lifting up. But I mean, yeah, I'm going to do that and then let Stefan decide if he wants to just carefully lift this and get some super glue under it or epoxy or something. 
This is definitely the better shell though. Yeah, I've just done that, stuck a piece of tape there to hold it. And it's, uh, yeah, a lot flatter. So it, it shouldn't catch inside the CD32. But if this was mine, if I was keeping this one, I would, I don't know, maybe heat it, pull it up a little bit, and then stick some uh, really strong glue under that side and then put it back down. But yeah, that tape, that is gonna do the job by the looks of things. So while Stefan's unit is on test, uh, I've also got to stick this back down. It's the test and quality control thing, which went up here. So yeah, I'll just get some of that rubbery glue and stick this back on uh, mine here. Thanks ever so much to Stefan for letting me keep this. I am chuffed to bits, even though I've got a sound issue with this, I am chuffed to bits with this. It's going to be a prized part of my collection. Yeah, and i just got some of that under there. You can see I'm just uh, sliding it around a wee bit just because it was mostly in the centre but straight away you can see that's stuck down totally flat so I'm pleased with that I am just going to clean the top of the EEPROM here because just where the uh, label edge is here it's a bit sticky yeah so this side's nice and clean uh, that one now needs the same cleaning so yeah, it's got a little bit of a dint in this one as well. So yeah, this is why I think I'd rather give Steph on the other one because this one's not quite as good as it. Um, there is quite a lot of dirt on there. So do you know what I think I'm going to do is just get some IPA and give that a bit of a scrub under there. Yeah, I can see the dirt coming off. That's looking good as new under that. You know what, this is the one I'm keeping, I'm going to carefully peel that off, I think. Is it going to come off? Yeah. Oh, there we go. But you can see, it looks a bit faded there, and it's, I think it's just the glue. If we give that a bit of scrub. Yeah, it looks so much better. Look at that. Yeah, so a tiny bit of uh, Maguire's Plast RX. And you can see in the light there, can you see? It looks a bit weird. So yeah, we'll just get a wee bit of that on there. Just check it to make sure no colour's coming off. And I don't think so because it's one of these where it's, uh, you know, it's assembled a certain way in terms of the uh, printing on that. So you can't rub it off. That's it. Anyway, that will do for me. I search my shirt as forward as it can be. We'll reassemble this thing in a sec. There we go with therapeutic clicks and squeaks. And I can show you how this is assembled just by dismantling this one. I need to because there's a bit of rust there and it looks really dirty. So, yeah, we'll take this one to pieces. I'll clean this up. I think what I'll probably do is just go stick these both into the ultrasonic cleaner actually. Yeah, and then this just uh, pulls out. So again, I'll send Stefan the better one of these back. You've just got to sort of prise it out of this thing. That's it. Is that glue? Yeah, I spot the unlucky spider that climbed into the back of that. I need to get some more of this deoxid. This is my last tube. It's about seven or eight pounds that, maybe even nine. Uh, yeah, I did exactly the same thing with the one for Stefan. Just push it in and do a little bit of that. And you can go forwards and backwards quite nicely in these, unlike Neo Geo slots where you can get caught really easy and you've got to go quite slow. Yeah, so these are just a uh, hot melt glue. So we're just gonna heat that in a minute because it's hanging on, look sat there and I'm gonna have to re replicate those on the other one because I'm not even sure that one's got any on it I'm having to remelt this because those glue things actually sit on top of the plastic notch that pokes through the shield that's how those work it was glued on yeah yeah, I'm not sure you can see what I'm doing here. Yeah, I like that. 
and the narrow slots to the right hand side uh, as you get that back into there. I'll try and get this in now without pulling that glue off. Uh, and then just put the three screws back into position. That's it. And then our card goes like that, I think. Right, let's try that again. That lid has been up and down, up and down, up and down about a hundred times. And that's why it's a good idea to stick bubble wrap over your uh, window there. So, a wrist strap on. This is the one that's going to go back to Stefan then. So I'll give the PCB a final clean here, but it's had uh, new shorter 100 microfarad caps here. All of these 229 microfarads, there's one up there, look, um, have been swapped out. That was a smaller one. I, didn't, I ran out of the same physical size, but it's the same, you know, uh, capacitance and voltage rating. Uh, yeah, that one there. We had to fix a trace on this because this side of uh, that cap there I think that's the one, was uh, broken uh, off the board. I think that had happened in transit actually, I'm not sure. It lo looked like it had happened in transit to me. Obviously this chip was swapped off the second board. It's now got its original RAM back in. I reflowed uh, the uh, DAC there because we swapped that out as well. That was one of the first things I did. We plugged two wires up there as well, just dealing with that bit of corrosion. And as I say, all of the other 220 nanofarad caps, you know, they're, they're twice as wide as that cap there, for example, the quite wide ones. All of those have been swapped on that because I am convinced that that particular type of cap seems to fail. Oh, and one other thing, obviously, we on this one here, I think it was this here, the ferrite was uh, a bit broken there. It wasn't like cracked or anything, just open circuit. So we fitted a one ohm resistor, and it, it, all it does is it joins the, you see the circle? That's ground connects to the cam, just joins it up to the main ground line, so one of them being one ohm isn't an issue because you've got four of these, there's one in each corner here, um, yeah and then I think that was glued down a little bit as well just like on the other one, so yeah that's pretty pristine and obviously 100% fully functional so that can go back to Stefan. And there we go, all back together. So Stefan did kindly say, you know, right at the start there, when only one of them was working, he's like, I'll oh, just keep them both, just keep them both. I was like, well, I'm determined to try and get them working. So, And at that point, you see, I'd kind of given up on the first one that wouldn't boot at all, because I assumed that he'd swapped all of the 7.4 series. And as things transpired, I don't think so. I think it was just a reflow. So, yeah, that's what made me revisit and work out the issue with the second one. Um, but the point is, he said, keep whichever one you want. And I was like, well, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, just keep whichever one you think is best. So I'm like, well, this is the best one, so I'll send you the best one. And I was like, no, 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 keep whichever one you, you think is the best. So I'm like, well, I think this is the best one. I'd rather you have this one, because I know I would want to have this one. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to send him this one, because it's lovely, isn't it? It's almost good as new. The only thing I don't have, as I mentioned, is these screws here, but it clips together. You know, the top holds on, so I assume Stefan might have those screws. Um, yeah, so this is going to be the one I send back. Isn't it nice? It's lovely and obviously fully functional. But I haven't really shown much in terms of removal and fitting things. I've skirted over so much because I've been in a rush because I've got a few other things here. I've got some 4,000 boards lined up. I've got a 3,000 board that has arrived. Um, yeah, and I've just been a bit short of bench space. I'm sure that's probably been <laughs> evident in this video. The knee cam um, has uh, featured a few times here. Uh, yeah, but just finishing up now, this board is perfect now in terms of, uh, you know, cleanliness and stuff. Uh, it's just this we need uh, and I did post on Twitter ask if uh, you know if anyone knew where to get one of these from because even UT source came back with sorry you know uh, the value is at zero we haven't got any in other words we can't get hold of them and I contacted one of the place that was recommended from a chap on Twitter that might be uh, a follow-on if we can get hold of one of those um, yeah we'll see what comes back but I think these are just like not available anymore they seem to have just gone uh, Stefan kindly did some searching on eBay for MPEG cards and things that may use the same chip and he did find one and I was super excited up until the point I realised what it was and he'd, he'd found a card and it was 199 euros I think with that chip on and it was a Zorro 2 card for an Amiga 2000 or something and I was like well 
yeah and technically I could spend the 200 euros if I could if I save that up or something over the next few months and then get one of those take the chip off fix this and then I've got a Zorro 2 card that I then want to fix and I'm back to posting on Twitter and stuff again does anyone know where to get one of these from so I can fix this Zorro 2 card um, I think if it was a PC card I wouldn't be bothered to be honest I mean the right PC cards just as nice as Zorro cards but for me Zorro is always going to have the ace up its sleeve versus an ISA or you know PCI card so uh, yeah I would be making the sacrilegious decision there of taking one of these off a PC card to fix a Mega card um, I'd rather just find one of these as a you know a second hand unit or something uh, anyway let's see what happens over time uh, lower profile uh, caps here so that they fit inside the shield um, and the shield ultimately is going to be one of the reasons why these die because look how close it is it's like the components like right up almost against the top there they don't touch but they ain't far off all right there's got shield uh, gaps in the shield in here but that sort of thing is going to add to the demise of a product like this isn't it um so one of the final things because i haven't shown much of the uh the soldering and soldering can you see these beefy fat caps here? Yeah, these are one of the 220 nanophores I haven't swapped. So we've got one there, and there's one here, and there may be one or two others. So I'm just going to, oh, there's one there. So I'm just going to remove these. I'll show you me removing them. And I've got some tiny, tiny ones that are a wee bit short, but you know what? The, the right capacitance, the good quality, good manufacture, and the right voltage. So I'm just going to swap the remaining ones because I think, as we've proven now, they die when they're in this area here and on both boards these have failed when they're here and it's the same one 220 nanofarad it's the same part yeah um there could be a reason why and it could be a voltage mismatch scenario so we're back to the what i talked about in the cd32 repair series there when i did my own in that the the power switch on the back of the cd32 switches two power rails you've got five volts and you've got 12 volts and if you get a switch bounce you can end up with five volts and not 12 volts for a period of time until the contact cell if you've got a dirty switch you can end up with uh, five volts and no 12 volts if you've got a dodgy power supply you can end up with five volts and no 12 volts what happens to various parts of the circuit there when you've not got 12 volts i don't know is it possible you could have an issue well i theorize that that might be why the color transistor died on my cd32 because that just happens to use the 12 volts on its uh, collector i think so you had like a base voltage you had an emitter you had like zero volts collector um or something like that in that sort of scenario what happens i don't know um you've also got on here and this complicates matters perhaps you've got a 7805 here you've got a 7805 here both independently providing five volts to different areas of the circuit what happens if you get one of these and not the other what happens if the 12 volts is not there on one one part of the circuit the audio bit or the video bit that needs 12 volts for something else so yeah maybe those are the sorts of things that cause this ceramic up here to just obliterate itself because on the first one we looked at there was a crack across it and a measured and it wasn't short but it had cracked in other words at some point it had short and, and blasted itself open now because i'm using an atx power supply that's why on uh, one of these i forget which one it was when i powered it on i said oh i've just had a small fire kind of thing i could smell some burning and the, the cap on that that was okay that didn't have a crack had suddenly just gone nuclear yeah so uh, yeah anyway that was my reasoning for swapping all of these 220 nanofarads and incidentally i measured the ones on both circuits there for the uh, you know the red green blue you know the ones removed for the color issues on the first board i removed them accidentally because i got the boards mixed up but i measured them and there's nothing wrong with them they measure uh, correct capacitance there's no resistance yet when they're on there you get weird color issues what you need is 1206s yeah 220 nanofarad 1206s these are exactly the same spec i think slightly low voltage 25 volts but they aren't 1206s so i can get away fitting one of these on here i'm going to struggle with the blooming tweezers for sure it's probably going to ping off now so yeah, what you can do is use the, oh I can get it, grab it, grab it with the tweezers. And this is the thing, the tweezers are going to melt now, aren't they? You want metal tweezers. Yeah, just heat that one pad. There we go, it's kind of on there, look. 
yeah anyway you get the idea that's in place but it's not straight and because it's such a small cap I need to just micro adjust this this is where I'll use this uh, tool and this is why I just find it so much easier using this tool generally yeah so I just sort of get it into position hang on and of course you can just reflow with a bit of hot air in fact I'll do that in a minute anyway just so you can see it so you'll be able to see using a component that's uh, perhaps not uh, the physically the right size you can make it fit so yeah a bit of solder there as well let's just get the hot air on yeah so hot air is on 400 degrees and um, we'll just heat this and it will probably just sort of centralise itself a little bit better once it gets up to temperature if you're going to heat things like this generally I'm going to hold this up generally I'll have it uh, a metal tin or something underneath it just so that the heat doesn't transfer through to whatever's below and in fact it's kind of standing off there so it'll be alright the table might get a little bit warm yeah and I'll just occasionally just tap it there we go it's, it's moving around now so yeah, it hasn't pulled itself into position. So a couple of little taps like that. Just like Stefan's board, super clean and tidy. Data bus buff was replaced. This was the faulty one. That's why this was not booing at all. Again, uh, shorter capacitors installed here. All of these 220 nanofarad caps replaced here. 1206s uh, under the wide type. Normally, you have to fit the narrow ones. Uh, yeah, some shorter ones used in places like that, but it's the same. You know, the right components, sizes, and stuff. Uh, that one, that one. This was off to swap to the other board. Um, yeah, the cap there was okay. It was the one that had the, it was the other board that had the wire there. Um, yeah that one swapped out obviously this has now got the faulty audio chip on it yeah, that cap was swapped out that cap was swapped out and there's that ferrite there that was replaced for a one ohm as i say it's just on the ground we've got three other ones so it's not that essential that it's not a ferrite um yeah we've got a cap there a cap there a cap there um and one or two others that i have lost track of but anyway you can see it's in excellent condition and everything looks really good maybe one or two of the caps aren't straight as they could be let's uh, hold that on the shield we'll check the 7805 here first let's just check the first pin so that's the output 5.17 volts which is what you'd expect it's a 5 volt regulator and the input being very careful is 9 volts 9 volts that's weird there should be 12 on here how have we got nine going in? That may be normal. Um, and then we've got a 7805 over here, this thing. So if we measure, I think one of these caps here. Ah, oh, that's 12 volts. So it's 12 volts goes into this one here. Let's just uh, carefully, I'm just gonna have to just lean on this, carefully just try and probe pins around that. There you go, five volts on its, uh, this first pin here. Just checking the other pins anyway. It's interesting how a 7805 is in an eight pin package there I'm not quite sure what they were thinking about Oop, when they came up with that yeah so the output is that top pin there for sure on that, that corner pin bottom left as it's facing us so our two 5 volt supplies are there I'm just testing and see how hot that is it's interesting isn't it how that's got 9 volts there I need to look at the schematics to work that out uh, there is a, a diode down here maybe it's got a diode drop or something let's just Measure carefully across that diode. Five volts one side. Now that's between the five volt and nine volts. How have we got nine volts? I do need to check that. Um, anyway, so you you've seen the general thing. Let's just check some of these caps here as well. So you've got five volts there. These are coupling caps, I think. That one down there. Twelve volts on that. This one here. 4.62 now that is the 5 volts from my main power supply into the CD32 so at this point in time you can see I've got voltage drop there we should have 5 volts there my ATX power supply through the horrible power switch cable and all the rest of it is only giving me 4.62 volts that isn't the issue with the audio I ruled that out earlier but uh, yeah anyway you can see though that there's a number of different 5 volt supplies you've got the one from the CD32 the one from that regulator the one from that regulator 
three, three different five volt supplies. Um, and I presume it's going to be like the audio and stuff's on its own, the video's on its own, and the the rest of the logic comes from the main five volt rail uh, there, which is 4.6 uh, volts at the moment. Um, and that's to avoid no noise. You know, if you had everything powered by the same five volt rail with the same ground, um, you get problems. You know, you can get little glitches and things like that. So down here, it's going to be the main five volt rail probably. Yeah, 4.62. Over here again, it's going to be main 5 volt rail, probably 4.62. And the 74 series here is going to be the main 5 volt rail, so the utmost pins that corner one there, yeah, 4.62. I don't know where the VCC pin is on this, but I'm guessing that's going to be the same. And I think this is going to be taking it from one of these other areas. It might not be, that might be from the same place as this, anyway. Um, you get the idea, it's probably a case of the DAC's got a 5 volt supply and the stuff here's got a different 5 volt supply maybe all this logic here is all on the main 5 volts and just looking at the schematics you can see here we've got the audio DAC at the top so that's got its own 5 volt rail and then scrolling down we can see the video DAC also has its own 5 volt rail and just looking at that you can see there's a resistor or something to the left hand side and I suspect there's some voltage drop or something occurring from there um, I can't quite see what's the left hand side without joining all the pages up, but I suspect that 9 volts is correct. And you know what? This is a bit of justification on swapping all of those blooming ceramics. These are the ones we just took off this board, and it, the board was working, yeah? And I use literally hardly any heat to remove them, dead short. Yeah, that was showing one ohm. These ones here, no, no resistance so far, but you know, one of the ones we just took off as a precaution there is showing one ohm. So this is uh, exactly why, if you've got one of these and you don't swap out the 220 nanofarad ceramics, all of them, not just the ones on the RGB, yet waiting for some of the failure. So just putting back on resistance, I'll tell you what it says. Yeah, nothing on that one. And I've got some of the other ones we took off earlier as well. A lot of these have just gone straight in the bin, but I did keep, I don't know, another 10 or so. Again, no resistance showing on that one either. So we did find a shorted one on that i'm so glad i swapped those yeah and there's some of the other ones that i uh, took off so i'll test those and i'll report back yep and here's another one now this isn't a short but hang on it's a resistor 11.6k so yeah so a multimeter on my knee here's another one almost 3k look So it was only had on a three or four that were a short there in total, and maybe five if you include the two on the power sides on both of them that had blown themselves open. But those were just from generally around the board. So yeah, those 220 nanofarads swapped them all. And you'll remember that this is the board that had 50 ohms across one of the supply rails. I think it was this one here actually. And that's now gone, and it's exactly the same as the other board now, I think. Yeah, it's like a couple of K. So uh, there you go. Just as part of that final uh, recap there, you know, I'm not really recap, swapping out the 220 nanofarads. We got the resistance back down, but this board was working as it was. You know, you got a one ohm resistor there, it's just going to be drawing a lot of power. You know, yeah, if you had a thermal cam, you'd be able to see it getting hot probably. At some point, it probably would have shorted and burnt the trace up, certainly with an ATX power supply. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, there we go. So let's just get the lid back on. Uh, I left this print on here, actually improved it. <laughs> it was worn away a fair bit. So uh, yeah, I just used magnification, the black marking carefully, uh, just filled in the little gaps and stuff. So, because it's a bit of history. And I asked uh, Stefan about this and he was saying, I think it means uh, uh, received from uh, WL, is that, or WC person. 22nd of the 2nd, 1994. Uh, not sure what the ESCO means there. But yeah, it's a piece of history, so that's why I redid that slightly, just so that it's not worn away as it was. Uh, yeah, this shell is a little bit battered compared to, oh, hang on, the one that I'll be sending back to Stefan. But it clips together, you can see, you know, you can't pull it apart. So even though I'm missing the screws around the sides here, um, no big deal. So I'm very, very pleased. And you know what, it doesn't look too bad. It's been polished up there. It doesn't look bad, yeah, there's a few little marks and things, but this is why I opted to keep this one. It's not perfect, but it's my not perfect FMV module. There we go. 
well, there we go and these are going back to Stefan so I do hope you found the video interesting please like share subscribe if you'd like to support the channel please see the coffee and patreon links down below I'll catch you in the next video